Good afternoon. This is Maria Barnes. I am the um, president of the Access Lunchtime user group. Access Lunchtime is designed to provide uh, an overview of different parts of Access. We have in accessusersgroup.org several different groups. Some of them have different types of specialties. There's one for web apps. There's one for an interface with SQL Server. Um, there's others that specialize in desktop apps uh, for Access. But Access Lunchtime is designed to be an overview of all different types of Access and hopefully something that people that are busy in the evenings or at other times maybe can get away for an hour at lunch, sit down in a quiet place in their office or home or wherever they happen to be, um, eat some lunch and listen to an informative presentation. So that is what we are designed to do in this group. Um, and you can find videos of all of our presentations um, uh, on accessusergroups.org and then by following the lunchtime link. This presentation is being recorded um, and we do have everyone that is attending muted. Um, we, you do have the opportunity to type in the chat session and I will try to answer your questions as we go. Um, and then at the end we'll have uh, an open mic um, section where you can go ahead and ask your questions if you have some. Today, um, oh, first, before we go into today's presentation, um, I just want to give a little plug for some upcoming sessions that we have planned. Um, next month, we meet the last Tuesday of every month, not the fourth Tuesday, but the last Tuesday, which is sometimes the fifth Tuesday, um, at noon Central Time. And so next month, we're going to be covering SQL Server Migration Assistant. As we start through today's topic, you may wonder why we are doing that, as we will talk about SQL Server Migration Assistant, or SSMA, today. But the whole topic of um, migrating to SQL Server from Access is quite a large topic. There are plenty of issues that we will not be able to cover today because we only have an hour at being lunchtime. So I will go into more details um, and specific um, types of things you can do, configuration settings and reuse of a project, etc. in next month's uh, meeting. Then in March, we're going to do a Q&A session where we take questions for the group. Um, the following two se se sessions I have uh, specifically put in um, at different users' requests. So if you have a topic that you would like to be covered in a future month, um, indicate that in a chat. There's a link on the website where you can send me a message. Um, the two things that were requested during this past year were to cover more about web apps using Azure. So we will cover that in April. And then um, I'll probably change the title on the May to be a little broader than this, but the, they wanted covered differences between Office 2010 and Office 365. Um, I see another um, request, uh, integrating access with Power BI. So I will make note of that, and we will um, get a presentation on that. That's not my forte, but I know of some others that um, that is their forte, so we might have a guest user that month. So maybe we'll try. Um, I'm not sure if we'll do June. Last year we took a break during the summer because of attendance, so maybe we'll schedule that for early fall. All right, thank you for joining us. Um, today we are going to cover using the SQL Server Migration Assistant or SSMA, to load access tables to SQL Server. Uh, we're also going to cover how to link your access application to the SQL tables that you've loaded. 
and a little bit about the different SQL Server clients. There's three of them, uh, ODBC, the native um, client, which is also known as OLDBE, and the Windows client. We are not going to cover um, installing a SQL on your machine. There is a video uh, with the same name, how to upgrade access application to use a SQL Server backend, that's in the access user group uh, named SQL Server with Access. You could look at that, and that has, in addition to some of the same things we're going to cover today, it has um, a, an example of installing um, SQL Server Express, um, if you want to see that in video format. We are not going to cover splitting your database into a front and back end, but I would like to take this time to reiterate that that is very important to do. For those of you that are using Microsoft Access for more than one user, it is not okay to simply put that database on a network drive and for multiple people to share that single access database. What will happen if you try to do that is that you will inevitably get corruption in your database. The, and, and this makes no difference whether or not you have your data in SQL or whether you have it in Access. If you're all using the same front end, you will get corruption. Not necessarily in your data if you've got your data in SQL. Um, but in your application, which is your front end. And I also might take this time just to explain to those of you who are not as familiar with SQL Server. SQL Server is not a front end. You, there is no such thing as a form that you can design in SQL Server. They do have reports. Um, they do allow queries. They do have programs like VBA code that is um, in SQL stored procedures or functions, but you cannot design a form in SQL Server. You have to do it in another application, in a .NET application, in Microsoft Access, something like that. Um, so what, what you're going to see today is an example of both a single access database that has the front end and the back end, combined, meaning it has the tables along with the forms and queries, and a split, already split database, and we're going to show how to migrate them both to uh, SQL Server backend. I'm also not going to go over the access upsizing wizard. Uh, that was a feature that you used to be able to use in access. Uh, it was deprecated when access 2013 came around, but it, it was a useful tool that some people used. Um, so if you are using an older version, you need to know that it used to exist. Um, and I'm also not going to cover importing from SQL Server. Um, so you can, from SQL Server, uh, you can right-click on a database, and you can use their import function, and you can choose access and import from it. Um, it's more work to do it that way, uh, and also, in, unless you um, do some manipulation, at least right now, um, the standard even that come with SQL Server 2014, which is what I'm running right now, um, the standard, it's called SSIS interface, doesn't even allow you to, to browse to an ACCDB, ACCDB, which is the 2007 and beyond format database. It does allow you to browse to MDB databases, which are the older ones, uh, but it's you know just not updated uh, unless you do some, some tweaking to it. Um, so uh, the, the thing to use right now is SQL Server Migration Assistant, and so that's what we are going to cover today. There are several reasons to upgrade to SQL Server. Uh, one of the biggest uh, that, that, or what, what often tips people 
uh, to use SQL Server is the size of your data. Desktop access is limited to 2 gigabytes of data for the database. Um, and um, SQL Server Express, by uh, contrast, um, in 2008 R2, um, all the way through 2016, uh, is, is limited to 10 gigabytes. So that's five times the, the amount of size. Um, and that's just with Express, uh, which is the, the free version of SQL Server. Uh, and then it, depending upon your um, application, if you buy uh, a version of SQL Server that is beyond Express, uh, the size is virtually then unlimited. Uh, you get something like 524 petabytes right now, um, which is about a quadrillion bytes. So I don't know what kind of databases you are building. Mine don't approach that. Um, but I do, however, at one of my clients, support um, an access application that is linked to SQL Server. Um, I think they're using 2008 right now, um, not Express. And, and there is that's quite large because it makes use of um, medical claims data, which um, we've got, got many, many, many rows, um, and so it would never, never fit on an access backend, um, just from a size perspective. Uh, there also is the security reason. Um, Windows-based uh, security is one option in SQL Server. Uh, it can, to be simplified, it can be driven off of Active Directory. So, for example, if you set up an Active Directory group um, and you call it whatever, you can add to your SQL Server database that Active Directory group as a user. And then as you add individual users to that Active Directory group, they automatically inherit the same permissions as that group has in SQL Server. Uh, you can also set up SQL Server-based security. It can be more complicated to maintain if you've got lots of users. Um, they, they are times when you could set up like an application-level SQL security user. Uh, you know, you might call it my application or whatever your application name is and set that up as an individual user and then have that coded into your compiled code with your connection and password link. Um, and you can get granular in SQL Server. You can have um, multiple databases on one server and different databases assigned to different security. You can have different tables. You can have um, read and write and insert and delete all as separate options in SQL Server. In Microsoft Access, pretty much all you can do right now um, it, besides um, your own internal forced security based on, you know, a, a table of users that you have is, you know, from, from a Windows directory level, anyone who, who has access to your back end, if it's in Microsoft Access, has to have read and write access to that directory. Um, all the table level or feature level access security wise that you would want to do, you have to do manually in Microsoft Access if you're not making use of SQL ser Server. Um, you can also easily um, set up backups. Uh, there's continual backup options um, or you know you can time your backups to, to be a complete backup at, at specific times. Um, much much easier uh, than you can and much more flexibility with backups than you might have with Microsoft Access where the only real backup you can do is to take a complete copy of the database at whatever time you're trying to do it at. And there's also quite a bit of uh, more reliability in SQL Server. You don't get instances where um, you've probably seen in Microsoft Access, if you've been using it for a while, where you get data corruption. 
Um, this generally happens if you get something like a power outage when you're trying to write to something. You just don't see that in SQL Server um, nearly as often as you do in um, Microsoft Access alone um, because of the way that it processes transactions and checks the transactions. Um, if it were to try to do something like that, it just that particular row or record or uh, whatever would not be saved um, if it was unable to be completed because of power, for example. It wouldn't corrupt the whole database. Um, and then in some cases, um, you can get improvements in processing speed. But I will just say, for starters, that just by linking tables to SQL Server, it does not necessarily mean that you are going to see speed improvements. In fact, if you do not do this right, and if you link only your tables and you have your queries sitting in access still, it's possible you could actually operate slower um, by linking to SQL Server. And uh, I'll try to talk a little bit of, more about that when, when we get into the upgrade itself. Um, okay, so for to use SQL Server Migration Assistant, you want to download it, first of all. Um, you can uh, download it by searching on SQL Server Migration Assistant. Um, make sure when you get it, you get the one for Microsoft Access. Um, and there are also a couple different versions. Let me see if I can pull up a window here. Okay, you can see here that when you get past the ads um, that you get um, SQL Server Migration Assistant. You see some for Access. You see some for MySQL and Oracle. So you want to make sure you get the one for Access. Um, and then um, you, oh wow, they've got a 7.2. Let me see what that is. I didn't know about that one. That might be worth checking out. Um, I'm using, today I'm using 6.0. Um, but 7.2 is probably the next one to try. It looks like it just came out in December. Um, anyway, so you want to make sure you get um, the latest and the one for access. And then when you do download it and install it, it will actually install two versions um, on your computer. Um, you will have 64-bit and the 32-bit one. So you want to make sure that you use the correct one. And then once you have the correct one, if it still doesn't work, I would recommend um, installing um, Access 10 or Access 13 runtime. And that might fix connection problems. Um, when I first installed it, I got some kind of message about um, it, the connectivity not being able to um, really work. and, and as we go through this demo today, you will see, and I'll point out, where I had problems the first time and had to go back. Um, so I have it, I think I ended up with the 32-bit on mine. Um, SQL Server Migration Assistant, yep, I've got the 32-bit on mine, but um, that's just because that's my machine. Um, so you open it up. And it gives you like a wizard, okay? Um, and you just follow the wizard. You can name a project. Um, I'm going to, I guess, first of all, um, and, and before you do it, upgrade um, a Microsoft Access database, you want to make sure that you make a copy of it, okay? Um, I am going to first do um, the contacts database, which if you've seen any of my demos before, you've seen it before. This is an all-in-one database. It has, this is actually a, a template that uh, we see um, or that you can get and download um, from Microsoft Access. 
Um, I added my own data here when I was playing with it. Um, so the tables are here. Um, it has a couple queries. It's got some forms, a um, couple reports. I think it's got a couple macros in it and a couple modules. The only thing that we are going to be, in this case, adding to SQL Server or moving to SQL Server is um, the tables. Everything else is going to be the same, and we will hope then works with link tables to SQL Server when we're done. Um, oh, so I made a copy of this first before I did this, and I'm going to go ahead and close it so it's closed while we do it. But there's a copy, and the copy's there because what if you mess up? What if you don't like what you've done? Maybe you want to compare the old versus the new, whatever. Take a backup before you get started. Um, Okay, and, and since I'm going to do context, I'm going to go ahead and name this context. Um, you don't have to name it. You don't have to save your project, um, but um, and, and you can save it wherever you want. Um, this is the default place um, to do it, but you could save it, you know, in your client's folder with the database or whatever. And then um, you have the option of migrating to several different versions of SQL Server. So if you have different versions available to you, um, you choose whichever one you want to migrate. Uh, notice that SQL Azure is one of the options. That was new in version 6, and I imagine that uh, 7.2 or whatever it is also has that as an option. Not sure if it has other options, but I will try to um, investigate that as a follow-up to today to see what else we might have. Um, okay, so I'm going to choose 2014 because I have SQL Server 2014 installed on here. And then you want to add a database or databases. And so you simply browse to your database. And I was here before, so I went straight there, but you know you would, would browse to wherever. And I'm going to do the context database first. It's the all-in-one. And then when you do that, it should load in that content database that you chose and give you the option of <clears throat> specifying to load the queries and the tables or just the tables. And for today's purpose, I'm just going to cover the tables. Um, in next month's demo, I will go over the queries and how to do what's called a, a pass-through query. Um, to SQL Server, and, and that takes full advantage of the capabilities of SQL and helps speed up your application. If you use queries in Access against tables in SQL Server, for the most part, it tries to bring all the data back from SQL Server, and then in Memory and Access, do the join or whatever it's doing, or the filtering. Um, so it's got a lot more communication, uh, whereas if you were to put that query in SQL Server, then the query would run using the SQL Server engine, and then only your results would be passed back, which should hopefully be a smaller subset, or you wouldn't have your query unless you're doing some big join where you're getting lots of information from uh, different normalized tables or something like that. Um, if you don't, when you are trying this, See the tables listed under here, you may get um, an error message looking thing and, and something about something not being right. So if you get that, I would first try, excuse me, the other version, like if you tried 32, I would try the 64 bit. <clears throat> and if you, if that didn't work, then I would try downloading um, Access 2013 or 2010 runtime onto your machine to see if that fixes the issue. Um, it's like a communication issue um, that it has. Um, anyway, you can choose to um, import all your tables, or in this case, for example, I don't want to import the USIS ribbons table that I have in this application. That's something that in order to work correctly, um, you know, access should just have that locally. It's really part of my 
set up. Um, I don't really want that in SQL in this case. So I unchecked it, and then it won't come in. Um, then you check next. And here's where you define exactly where the server is, the port, um, what database you want to call it. I want to call this contacts to be exactly like my database is. Um, you can specify the, the type of authentication you want to use. In this case, I'm just going to leave it as the faults, which is Windows authentication. Okay, now, if you had already created the contacts database or if it already existed in SQL Server, um, it would not prompt you with this. But since my copy of SQL Server, which let's go ahead and pull up, I'm going to use the SQL Server Management Studio. see here the databases that I have. Um, I do not have um, the um, contacts database in here. It does look like I have time and billing in here. Let's see if I got to erase that. Yes, so I'm going to go ahead and drop this too. Okay, um, so contacts database is not in here, um, so it prompts you that it's not in there and asks if you want to create it. Go ahead and say yes. So it will go then and it will um, create that database. And then it, uh, it asks you here if you want to link your original access tables to the migrated SQL Server database tables. Um, so in this case, uh, this first example, I am going to say yes. I want to link my tables because I no longer want those uh, original tables that are in that um, access database that you saw, the contacts database there. Instead, I want those tables in SQL Server. And because I say this, then um, it will handle that linking automatically for us. Um, if you don't check that, you if you forget to check that, you still can <coughs> link them. It's just another step when you're doing so. Okay? And then, yes, it's going to synchronize it with the data. It gives you some information here about what it's doing. And it, I might say here, this is a simple database. I uh, just had a few tables. I just have a few rows in each table, so this took no time at all. Um, if you have a large database with lots of tables and lots of rows, this might take some time. You might want to go get a cup of coffee, take a restroom break, something like that while it's actually working. But when you get back, when it's completed, you do want to look at your reports. In particular, you want to be concerned about errors that you have. So you can click on that, and then if you notice that these, there's boxes around here, if you unclick, that'll take the box off, which means it's not displaying the 31 information. I'm not going to display the warnings, although, um, you know, the first couple times um, you use this, you might look at the warnings, you know, to see. In general, I found that the warnings can be ignored, but the errors you should look at. So, um, in this particular database, uh, it happened to make use of an attachment data type. And that data type is not supported in the conversion from SQL Server, uh, from access to SQL Server. So if you were actually um, upgrading this particular database, you would have to decide what to do about that. You would have to have some other means of storing that attachment, which in this database is actually, let me show that. Um, 
it's actually, if you look up, in here and put a picture, but maybe that was in my copy. Let's go back here. Nope, I don't see that either. Um, okay, so for, for these people, you can, if you want, uh, put a picture, and so that's where the attachment is. Um, so the, the picture uh, would not have come over with the the uh, upload or the upgrade uh, using SSME. Um, all right, so that that's what your warnings or your errors are. Uh, let's go ahead and back to that. Um, so you want to, at minimum, you know, identify what they are. Um, so that you can then make a plan for um, addressing them in your application. And then close, um, and it does have that saved. Uh, in next month's presentation, we'll uh, talk about how you can use your recent projects to do more things um, down the line. Um, and you can actually customize what you do if you don't like the way SQL Server maps a particular data type in access to another type in SQL Server because not all the types are identical between the two, two um, types of databases. Um, you can actually change those settings in SSMA so that they operate differently. But you will see here, if I go back to my SQL Server Management Studio, and do a refresh. Then I have my contacts database. And here's all my tables. I like my contacts tables. There's my data in it. They all came over. Um, and you will notice a couple things if you go like into design mode. The ID fields that are typically in access, access here, um, okay, uh, be, be, I guess let's mention this before I talk about the ID field. Okay, so what it did in access, because we said link tables, is it actually made a copy of your, or it renamed rather, your local table. This was your local table. So like if we it see it, how it has SSMA dollar sign in front of it and then dollar sign local. But this is exactly your old local table here, uh, the contacts table. So you can see here that it used to be an auto number. Um, in SQL Server, it is now an integer type and then the Identity specification here is, yes, it's an identity. So that's how it correlated those two. It, it, there's no such thing as an auto number field in SQL Server, but you can specify um, a field as an identity field. Um, so um, that's you know what it looks like in the SQL Server conversion of it. The other thing it did was add this timestamp column to it. And uh, it won't always do that. I believe that if you already have um, a, uh, a timestamp field in there, like this is a date time, um, context modified, then it will not add of um, the tables. It will add a timestamp field. And the purpose of that is to um, coordinate um, whether or not it, the, it has been updated or not, and who's last updated it, and that kind of thing, um, so that it helps make your table and your data updatable in SQL Server um, from the access front end interface. Okay, so besides the data types and being different and adding the timestamp, 
because we checked linked, it made a uh, renamed your old ones, and then it created a linked table. And you can see that if you hover over this, that connection string there is um, going to the SQL Server and going to the database contacts and the particular table contacts. This one goes to contacts modified, etc. Um, and um, you don't see the the um, one that we didn't do because I think I don't have uh, system objects checked, but if you check that, you can see here um, that um, the MSIS, you know, normally hidden tables are there, and this USIS ribbons, this was left alone. It's not renamed, there's not a linked table because we had unchecked that box um, during the, the update. Um, so it takes care of all that for you. Um, you really have nothing else to do in this case, except for, of course, fix that um, attachment, you know, because you, any pictures that you might have uploaded into there, the pictures did not come across. So you would have to deal with that and figure out how to change your front end and um, your SQL back end to handle that properly. Um, so that is a combined front end, back end application. Um, and you, again, to just to reiterate, if you were deploying this to multiple users, each person should have their own copy of this, which is now a front end. It's linked to a SQL Server back end. They should not be sharing it. Um, so let's go here then and do the second example. Um, so I'm going to go back here um, and I'm going to start the wizard again. Let's go ahead and save that. Um, this says metadata missing, so I've, I'm going to go ahead and save the metadata for that just so we have it done. Okay, we're going to start it again, and this time we're going to migrate. Um, this application, time and billing, and um, I made a copy of the front end already. Let me go ahead and make a copy of the back end. Okay. In this case, we have a. Um, this is the front end. So notice it has no local tables except for those system tables, which. Oops. What did I do here? There we go. Um, these tables um, are linked to that back end Microsoft database. So these are, uh, notice that instead of having the ODBC type indicator with the globe, they show a, a normal table indicator, but the little linked um, icon. Um, and so for this particular project, these are already, this front end is already using linked tables. So I don't need to migrate the front end. I need to migrate the back end. The back end holds only tables, and I'm essentially going to make a copy of it in SQL Server by migrating it to SQL Server. So we're going to start the same way, all this time billing. Again, that's an application that I got um, from one of the templates, um, access templates. Really simple to use for demo purposes. So here I'm browsing to the back end. I still made a copy of it. It's just always a good idea to do. You don't want to lose your customer's data or anything like that because you messed up and made a mistake. Again, I'm going to choose tables. In this case, I'm going to do all the tables uh, because um, that's, you know, what I want to do here. There's no system tables or anything like that. Um, what do you want to call it? What authentication do you want to use? 
It doesn't exist. Do you want to create it? Yes, I do. In this case, I am not going to choose link tables because I need to link the tables um, from the front end. I don't want to create link tables in the back end, which is what I'm choosing here. Um, I'm not even going to use that back end anymore after this because my data will now be in SQL Server. So I just don't need that step. Okay. Notice we got three errors this time. And rule of thumb, the bigger your tables, um, the more tables you have, the more complicated your design, um, the uh, more likely errors are going to be. So again, this has um, information or problems about um, uh, attachment data types in several of my uh, tables. This is probably one for each table um, that you've got, um, and it's not supported. So we would look in our original database for attachment types, and we'd have to figure out what to do with it. And this may be where I put my example, um, not in the other one, uh, because I know it was with myself where I uploaded a picture. So we'll we'll look at the two of them and, and how they're different. Um, or maybe we'll look at the before and after um, when, when we link up to the SQL to see what this looks like. All right, so I'm done here with um, SSMA. Um, I can go ahead and save this in case I want to use this next time. I'm just going to add the metadata to it. Um, and let's look at the existing application. Now this again is loaded to uh, and linked to the access backend. Um, I think if we go to playlist, yes, this is where. Here we show how I uploaded this nice picture of me um, in um, my um, employee record. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And that is actually in that back end table. That is saved. Let's just look at that um, for your um, benefit here. That's saved in the type. Yeah, yeah, I know it's open. Uh, that is attachment. It's just called attachments. How brilliant. Um, but it's data type attachment. And if you were to look at the table by itself, you would see that there's an attachment. And you could click on that, and you would see that that was a particular picture. Um, and, you know, you could open the picture or whatever from there. You know, that's that's how Access stores attachments. Um, so now let's show this in um, SQL Server here. And if, you, if you're not familiar with SQL Server, <laughs> if you make changes to it, um, usually you have to refresh before you can see. Um, the changes. So I just right clicked on databases and fresh. Here's our new database. Here's the tables. They all came in. You'll notice uh, the employees that it did bring in an attachments column, but it translated it to be Veracare 8000. You still have your timestamp added. You still have your ID as an int, not a um, a uh, auto number like it probably is in Access. And when we select and look at this, uh, you see, for example, the, the web page, which I think was um, a hyperlink. Um, they don't come in exactly like um, Access does, uh, but they're still readable. All that came in for attachments is basically the name of the file. Um, so I could use that. I could use the name of it if I knew where it was, if I had a path or something like that. If all of my attachments, you know, I had a standard or something, all my attachments were stored in the same folder, I could use that file name to go out and, you know, 
link that image in access to that file. Um, so, so it's still of use, um, it just might require a little more coding to use it um, rather than what already was done in, in Microsoft Access. Um, okay, so here it is in SQL Server, um, and how do I connect my Access database to it? That's the last question we need to answer here. And then I'll just provide you with a little information about the different types of uh, connections. Um, so here you see this database is still connected to that Access backend. And what you want to do instead is connect it to SQL. And so what you can do is use your link table manager, which on the um, most recent few versions of Access is on the external data tab. And you pull it up and select everything and prompt for a new location. And then you want, uh, let's see. Uh, you know what? Uh, we don't want to do this, sorry. Um, what we want to do instead is um, link it to um, SQL Server. Um, so we're going to create links to um, SQL Server. And so what we want to do is um, uh, probably create a file uh, data source. Uh, you might call it time and billing. And um, you here's the, the three um, possible um, clients that you can use for uh, SQL Server. Uh, the the uh, native client is uh, the one in general that has been recommended as being fastest in the past. It is apparently being deprecated at some point in the future. Um, the ODBC one um, is uh, the one we're going to use today. In general, it's a little bit slower than the native client, but it's supposed to be around for a while. Um, the SQL Server one is actually the, the Windows one. Um, it used to be have uh, kind of some problems with it, uh, speed in particular problems. Um, they are getting better. Uh, the, the interface is getting better with that one. And that is when you use the um, SSMA client, that is what it uses, the SQL Server Windows client as a default. So if you wanted to change that to be a different client, um, then you would have to do that after the fact, after you used it and use that link option. Or just not use the link option and then do this step. Um, so for this um, demo, I'm going to use the ODBC because it's the probably more recommended at this point uh, driver. So I select that and then um, you just put the name in. I should have not done that before. And maybe I want to do it the same spot, so they're all there. Oh, I've already got it there. Um, and that's it. That tells you, you know, what what you're going to do. Um, let's see. Make sure I had this right. Okay, do that first, and then you can make a description, um, put your server in. Depending upon whether you have your server browser, you may or may not be able to pull this down. Okay. Um, I do have mine here. Um, if you don't have the browser on, you can just go over to your um, uh, SQL Server and you, whatever you use on your connection string when you're connecting this right here, then that's where you would copy that and paste it into your 
server right here, and that works just as well if you don't have the SQL Server browser capabilities enabled. That um, it's a little more secure that way if you don't. Um, but um, uh, okay, and then you get a choice of Windows authentication or if it was SQL Server authentication, then you would check this other one and put the login and stuff in here. So if you're using integrated Windows authentication or if you're using a SQL Server authentication that's something like an application user, then you only have to do this step once in a front end and you can publish that to other users and as long as they, with their Windows login, have the rights to that database, they should be able to connect. They shouldn't have to create a file DSN on their own machine or anything like that. Um, you probably want to change the default database to be your database. And you can test it. In this case, it exists because I already um, created it, so I'm going to say yes because I want to overwrite it. Um, and then you choose the tables that you want. And all these other tables, those are all um, SQL Server tables. So they're all start with sys or they start with um, information. You don't need those. You just want to select the SQL Server ones, and then you select OK. And notice how it may link tables here. And here we're using the ODBC driver. Uh, I see the driver in the, the first part of the name. Let's go back to the other contacts that we did using the, whoops, too many clicks going on there. Just so you can see the driver there is SQL Server, which is the Windows driver, um, as opposed to um, it's still an ODBC connection. Um, but it's a different driver as opposed to driver, ODBC driver 11 for SQL Server. Um, then you notice that you still have your old ones, um, so you will want to delete those. And then you will also want to rename the um, ones here. So you will want to rename these so they don't have this DBO in front of them. What that DBO is, is the schema that they come from in SQL. So if you were designing this application from scratch and you had multiple schemas in SQL, you would probably leave those names and you would just you know, use those tables and it might be very helpful to you to know that that's DBO schema and the other ones, whatever schema that you happen to be using. So if you have a lot of these, I would recommend um, using um, a script. Uh, you can, in VBA, um, you can easily find a script uh, online to peruse through your database and look at all the tables in your database using the per project um, and, um, you know, strip off uh, DBO underscore uh, in the table name and save. Um, so here we've only got six of them, so just doing it manually. Keeps resorting them because <laughs> of the name here. Okay, so then we see that this is customers. Um, if I add one here and I put customer two in here, and then I go back to SQL Server. Select again, and I have two customers. We're linked here to the SQL Server directly. And so any changes you make from your Access front end will, you know, take effect in SQL Server. Um, so you see that it works the same way. Um, however, when you go, for example, to employee list, and you look at me from here, uh, suddenly you have some generic picture of some lady. Um, who doesn't even have eyes, much less she's not me. So, you know, the, the application works exactly as it did before, with the exception of the attachment fields, and so you, know, you would have to modify the application to take care of that. Uh, let's just go back to our 
presentation here. Um, and then it's just, I'll publish this uh, as a re reminder, but we went <laughs> through all of this, these steps um, and, uh, you know, what, what to do in these cases. Um, this is just a list of what we did um, on this. Uh, and then uh, as far as SQL Server clients, uh, you can download them by searching on SQL Server or whatever number you want to do. Um, ODBC driver um, uh, for 2014, it comes up with um, 11. That's ODBC 11 is the, the first one. Um, 13 actually allows you to connect to SQL Azure. Um, and you can use that with SQL Server 2016. Um, the native driver uh, for 2012 is the latest version. They're not supporting that any longer. Um, that Hence, they're deprecating. Um, you can actually get this um, by searching for SQL Server 2012, and then you look for um, feature pack. Um, then you have to like click install instructions and about halfway down you find a native client uh, download link that you can get. So it's a little more complicated to download that one if you do not have it. And there also is two versions of that, the 32-bit the and the 64-bit. Uh, the, let's see. So basically, um, from, from access, if you're trying to create a new um, ODBC connection, again, we have we have a three um, a standard one uh, that's called SQL Server is the Windows version. The one that says native is the one uh, in the middle here that we talk about that's being deprecated. And um, ODBC, uh, it's the one they want you to start using. Oh, but a note, you can't use uh, ADO to interface with ODBC type um, connection. So if that's what you prefer to do and that's what your code's written in, you should choose the native client instead um, and just deal with it. A um, little bit about SQL security. We're really running out of time, so I'll just post this. Um, there's some hints. Uh, there's lots of information online about best practices. Uh, maybe I'll try to go over some of this again with next month's meeting uh, because we're going to talk more about the SSMA uh, because SQL is more secure than Access, but at the same time you have to take steps to make it secure. There's just a lot more options to make it secure. It's not necessarily more secure by default, um, on, on default installation. Um, so, so you do want to pay attention to that. Um, and then I am going to leave you with some resources. Um, the SQL Server with Access group uh, is a great group to follow, and it's got videos up there, and we have um, uh, they have monthly meetings as well. Uh, I think they're in the evenings, I, and I don't remember which evening they are, but they've got their schedule and that schedule posted. Um, and they talk about this issue and other issues um, using SQL Server and Access together. Um, so if you're interested in this topic in general, they're a great group to follow. Um, if you have you know, the, the time to do it, uh, when, when they're available. Um, connection strings, this is a good reference to different types of connection strings. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about using DSN-less connection strings in the next presentation as well. That's what I prefer to do rather than doing this file name, DSN. Um, there's different types of data conversions you need to be concerned about when you're upgrading to SQL Server. So here's a link on that. And then finally, my contact info. Um, so, uh, Lucy, if you don't mind opening it up um, video uh, voice-wise to the group, see if there's anybody with any specific questions 
or you can type. I see that Giorgio is typing something. How do you solve the fact that you can't import pictures? Uh, there, there is ways to do it. Um, you can use blob storage in SQL and import pictures. I actually don't recommend doing that. There's, there's a lot of people that argue back and forth about the pluses and minuses in that. Um, the way I prefer to do it is to store the complete path names to pictures instead and then to have some kind of network store where you go out and fetch the pictures. Um, I just feel that's a better approach. Your database doesn't swell with your pictures. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about something that you need to move around and you want the pictures to go with it, then you would have to resort to some type of a blob storage. And then there's um, procedures you can use to basically take that blob in SQL and write it to some temporary file and, or area and then read that as a picture uh, into your application. It can get more complicated. Um, SQL's actually played with several different types of um, storage types that you can use, and some of them they've had around for a while and then deprecated. Um, so you can see it's, it, that picture storage is an issue um, that, that has different followers feeling like there's best ways to do it. And, and they don't always agree. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole issue which you should um, research if you, if you do need to do that. Myself, the way I always do it is by, like I said, or recommend to my clients. And, and other than, I think I had one that, that didn't want to do that and I had to go the blob route. But all the rest of them, they, they go with a network store someplace, a drive they can agree on. Sometimes we, or a lot of times we even put that drive in path in some kind of configuration file so that they can change that if they need to, you know, migrate where they're storing the pictures or something like that. Um, but I go with path names and that kind of thing. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. I do excuse the nasal congestion towards the end here. I'm still getting over a cold. Um, luckily, uh, you didn't get my coughing attacks, which if I had done this last week, I would have had a coughing attack in the middle of this. So um, thank you for putting up with it and joining us today, and hope to see you next month. Thank you very much.